Okay, we're going to continue to um, talk about this importance of relational ministry being, again, biblical. Um, why? Because everywhere in the Bible we read about relationships that God establishes uh, with his people. Uh, you can all, as we mentioned, go all the way back to the book of Genesis, follow it through to the end of the New Testament. Um, we ourselves... Uh, what are, how are we described in the New Testament as God's children? Uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17, bring that out. 1 John chapter 3, verses uh, 1 and 2, teach that. Uh, John's Gospel chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, teaches as many as received him to them gave you the power to become the sons of God. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5, we were adopted as God's children, and then as we mentioned, uh, the relationship between Christ and his church, we are his bride, Revelation chapter 21, verse 2. So everywhere you look in the Bible, uh, the biblical ministry models are always characterized by close relationships, uh, whether they are one-on-one -on -one relationships or small groups. Even Jesus, think about it, with his disciples. He chose out of all those in his sphere of influence, he chose 12. He poured himself and his teaching into those 12. And then within the 12, there was even another smaller group, three, Peter, James, and John, that he spent some even more intimate time with and spent more time uh, revealing some things to them that he did uh, that he did not to the other nine. So that's really incredible when you think about it. Um, calling each of those disciples, by the way, in the Gospels individually, uh, spent time in their homes, spent time in their lives, was with them on a daily basis, taught them, preached to them. And I think that God expects his peoples, uh, you and I as disciples of Jesus, to minister through relationships. And youth ministry is all about relationships. It's all about getting to know them. It's all about investing in their lives. It's all about finding out what they've gone through, what their backgrounds may be like. And then, you know, taking up, as we mentioned earlier in the first hour, that biblical frame of reference. That's where we begin in establishing our relationships based upon who they are in Christ. All right, so that's the first one. Uh, relational ministry is biblical. Secondly, relational ministry is responsible. Now, what do we mean by that? When we say that a relational youth ministry is responsible. Well, in this age of information and uh, impersonal technology, people often feel like faceless numbers, <laughs> to put it plainly, defined primarily by their demographic statistics. Imagine that. That's what people have been reduced to. Kind of nice to know that we're more than a, demogra a demographic um, you know, statistic. It's nice to know that somebody cares about us. It's nice to know, let's say, for instance, if you, were, uh, if you didn't sh show up at your local assembly for a number of days or weeks and people didn't see you, wouldn't it be nice to think that uh, th if someone would give you a phone call? I have missed you. Uh, I haven't seen you. Is everything all right? I mean, come on. Don't we love that more than anything else? We just love the fact that somebody is thinking about us. Somebody cared about us enough to pick up the phone or to go out of their way, knock on our door, see us, say, hey, are you okay? Is everything all right? I mean, come on. Uh, we can't live without that. We need that. And again, uh, I remember watching a, uh, a program years ago, one of these news programs about these, these children that were abandoned in, uh, it might have been the country of Romania, and uh, they were just put in this orphanage and they were just left there. Nobody cared for them, nobody took care of them. I mean, there was maybe one person who was assigned to watch over a whole room full of these small children, babies. And you know that, that uh, some of them were never touched. And then they realized, they did these to test, scientifically proving that their brains did not develop because they were never touched, they were never held, they were never loved. 
and they showed the vast difference between those that were loved, cared for, held, picked up, um, and, and, and shown some real love by another person, care. Uh, and, and there was such a dramatic difference in their lives as opposed to the others. And this kind of went on the air uh, nationwide in our country, which led to a lot of families deciding to adopt these children, thank God, and to provide the kind of care that they had been missing throughout you know, those childhood years, those crucial years. Yeah, I think it's true. I mean, if, if we are never... You know, if we don't receive encouragement from others, in whatever form it may come, uh, a handshake, an embrace, a uh, written form, you write a letter, you write a note, uh, you write the email, although the email, you know, that's not, you know, every, I suppose that puts us in the faceless, uh, impersonal category. But nevertheless, it's a form of communication. And if it's edifying, praise God for it. If it builds up the person that you're addressing, thank God for that as well. Um, you know, impersonal <laughs> sometimes have you ever gotten impersonal personalized junk mail yeah I mean it's like they know you I got one today from Rolex Incorporated John we have this information just for you oh so did you find out also that I could never afford a Rolex <laughs> okay I may know a few people that have them, but I, I couldn't even begin. I mean, you know, I'd have to mortgage my house to get a Rolex. No, they don't care. They just, they got your name. They got your address. Um, telemarketers, don't they assault households on a daily basis? Yeah, I mean, now we have ways that we try to eliminate them and keep them from uh, bothering us and tormenting us the way they so often do. Uh, how about even voicemail, right? Voicemail uh, removes people yet another step from personal contact. Yes, you have my voicemail. You don't have me, and I'm not going to let you get me. Uh, so you leave your message with my voice. That's as close as you're getting, because I really don't want to see you. No, and I don't, we don't mean to think like that, but you get the point. Um, nobody, and, and this is so true, nobody in our world, I, at least I hope not, nobody wants to be a target or an object or uh, uh, some way to earn points for their team. Nobody. We don't want to be that. And, and, and sometimes, by the way, in certain and some youth ministries, that's what you can become. You can become their, their target agenda, their demographic that they want to reach. You know, we're coming to your neighborhood because we realize that this particular demographic has not been hit by the church and you're our targeted people. Oh, that just makes you feel warm inside, doesn't it? <laughs> Thank you so much for making me your targeted people. Would be honored to be targeted by you. How about loving them? How about caring for them? How about knocking on their door? How about not just once, but going back uh, five times or ten times? And if you can sense that they're not rejecting you outright, that you just keep waiting and praying and hoping and believing that God is going to not just uh, allow them to open the door, but to open the door of their heart, and you're going to be able to get to them with the gospel. People, again, need people. Um, God, you know, never forget that God hasn't called us to, to use people to get people. That's not the purpose of our ministry, is to use people to get people. He's called us to love people the same way Christ loved them. And that's a sacrificial love. That's when we're ready to lay down our lives. And we thank God. I'll tell you, you know, um, just for example, Ben Munson, and there are others that may be here in this class as well, that assist him in his, um, his outreach to youth, to young people on Saturdays. It's one of the many outreaches that we have here in our local church. But what's so unique about this group of guys is that he's done it so consistently and so faithfully that we're beginning to see these young men and young women be discipled. We know their names. They come on the youth rallies. They're a part of our, our weekend activities. They come uh, on occasion soul winning. They come to the Bible studies. They come to camp. They come to the youth rallies. They come on our trip. It's amazing. And they're, they're, they're literally becoming uh, part of our local assembly because of somebody caring, somebody showing up week after week and making a difference in their lives. Good, that's a good tune. And, and, and I mean, it's really making, it's, it's, it's amazing. Now, if you just kind of breeze through their lives and, and you tell them, here, Jesus loves you, here's a gospel track, God bless you, I hope I see you in eternity, 
Uh, that's probably not going to make such an impact. It's probably not going to make a difference. But if you're going to be there week after week, and you're going to come not because, you know, there's a contest and the goal is to get as many young people in the youth ministry as possible, and if you win, you get a free trip to Bermuda. We know that that's not going to happen. Uh, but the point is, if that were the motive, then that would not be a pure motive in the eyes of God either. But when you care, you love, and you're not just getting them because that's what you're supposed to do, but you love them like Christ loved them. And, and now we're beginning to think as they get older and as they mature that maybe some of these young men and women, maybe they're going to think about Bible college. Maybe they're going to think about, you know, maybe the, the ministry is for me. Maybe they be, literally have been so rescued by that kind of ministry that they want to do it for others themselves. And then the work of Christ is reproduced in their lives. So, again, responsible youth ministry doesn't just evangelize people and, you know, leaves these recent converts to fend for themselves, um, you know, you can't do that. It's like uh, having a newborn brought to the delivery room, you know. Uh, you can't expect them to grow, to develop, and mature on their own. It's going to take love. It's going to take care. It's going to take taking that newborn and bringing it to its mother right away and the relationship is established, and the relationship grows, and the relationship is nurtured, and that's what you end up having, a relationship. And that's what we have as a goal, a relational kind of ministry. So a responsible youth ministry includes evangelism, to be sure. Also, it treats each person, uh, it treats each, each person rather as a valuable creation of God and handles them with care because of their uniqueness as individuals. Doesn't use young people, but loves them and helps to meet their needs through a very real biblical ministry. So it is responsible. And I mean, you know, that kind of responsibility obviously involves what? Commitment. Yes, a commitment. And at some point during the course, we'll talk about the nature of a commitment and how important it is and how valuable it is and how necessary it is. Because, you know, um, sometimes in, in youth ministry, you never know. It could be where God calls you on a permanent basis. You know, a lot of people, they look at youth ministry as a springboard on to bigger and better things. But for others, like myself, it's, it can be your life. From, it's been my life for the last 28 years. And that's, that's a good chunk of a person's life, 28 years. Maybe it's going to continue much longer. I don't know. If I can stay alive, maybe it will. I, I, I'm not sure. But the point is, is that it may be that God calls you to do that for the rest of your life. Imagine that. I mean, that's remarkable if God does that. But maybe not. Maybe it's going to be something transitional. Or maybe God's calling you to pastor a church. But in that church, you have the sense enough to know that if your church is going to be an effective church and a church that impacts the present generation and generations to come, you know you're going to have to have an effective youth ministry. You know you're going to have to reach young people. You know that the people in your congregation, is, as you grow older and you watch them grow older, if they're not going to be replaced by others that come, then you're not going to have a church. You're going to minister to the people that you have until they all die, and then you're going to die and nobody's going to be left. That's not a way to establish a ministry. So you want to reach the next generation. All right, finally, relational ministry is effective. It is effective. Um, we're not interested just listening to uh, the telemarketer. No matter how good the pitch is, uh, or the proposal, or the promise. Um, but we don't mind listening to a friend, right? I mean, the telemarketer, we don't really care. I mean, you can, you can look at the ID number on your phone and say, telemarketer, not answering. Or you can pick it up and say, listen, I don't care how good your spiel is. I don't care how, how much you promised me. I'm not going to do it. I mean, we get these calls all the time, don't you? I mean, just within the past week, I have won all kinds of uh, cards at Walmart, uh, at, at, for, for free gasoline, I even won a, tr a cruise. I won a cruise this week. But guess what? I could, I, I'm not interested. I don't call them back and say, I what? I want a cruise? 
I'm not interested because you know that there's a pitch behind it. You know that they say, yes, John, you need a cruise. Life has been challenging for you lately. You need a break. We're sending you on a cruise. It's because we love you. I mean, that, that'd be enough to, sh you'd be, you'd drop dead right there in your living room if you heard somebody say that. We're doing this because we love you. They don't do that. But if a friend calls you, I mean, that's different. You're going to want to talk to them, right? I mean, goodness gracious, in order to have an effective relationship, you're going to have to get involved. So uh, why, why would we do that for a friend and we wouldn't do it for a telemarketer? Simply because we know them and what? We have a relationship with them. We don't know the telemarketer. No matter how, you know, and, and believe me, I mean, I, people, oh, they can, they can talk the cat off the fish truck. Uh, and, and it's like they, they can say to you, oh, this, I, I, feel like we're, I feel like we've been friends, like we've known each other for years in our 10-second conversation. You know? And it's like they talk to you and they talk. I remember one time uh, my wife and I, we, we got hooked in and went to one of those things. I, maybe it was like, uh, what do they call those? Uh, Timeshare? Timeshares, yeah. Okay, did it once. Never did it again. But we did it once. Paid the price. But this guy was, oh, he was talking to me, and he, he finally, what do you do? And I said, oh, then we get to talking about basketball. He goes, oh, you work with the, the, the chaplain for the Knicks? Yes. He goes, well, one time I played basketball with Larry Bird, and, and, and I was unbelievable. He threw me a no-look pass, knocked me in, hit me on the head, knocked me right out. I came to, and there's Larry Bird saying, you all right? And, I was, and he's just going on, and we're just talking. And he was like, that's incredible. You played basketball with Larry Bird. It's amazing. And then, and then finally when he said, okay, this is all. And I said, not interested. And he goes, all right. Here's your thing. Go get your free camera. Get out of here. It was like, I mean, for, for, for five, uh, 10, 15 minutes while he was talking to me, you would have thought we were best friends. We go way back. We played basketball together. We knew each other's grandparents. I mean, it was incredible. <laughs> But once he realized, I'm not interested, I'm not buying, and I'm not going to spend a penny here. It was like, get out of here, I don't care about you, you're not my friend. <laughs> but you see, if a friend calls you, you will talk to them, you'll listen to them, you'll communicate, communicate with them. If they have something on their heart they want to share, you'll do that. I mean, how does that happen? You, with friendships and in relationships, you, you, you kind of win, you earn the right to be heard. And that's what we want to do in an effective youth ministry. We want to win the right to be heard. We want to earn the right to be heard. I guarantee you that those young men and those young women that Ben Munson ministers to, he has earned and he has won the right to be heard by them. Somebody else might not have won that right, and they will not listen to them. They will not hear what they say. But when he says something, they're going to listen. Why? Because they know if they don't, they're going to be in big trouble because he runs the show? No, because he's made the investment. His ministry has been effective. There's no doubt in their hearts, and there's no doubt in their minds that he cares. It's like the old adage, you know, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. I mean, you can impress people with your knowledge. You can impress people with your theology. You could impress people, young people in particular, by, you know, sharing with them some, some particular field of expertise that you have. But, you know, they might listen to you, but if they don't think you care about them, they won't care, really, what you have to say. And they certainly won't care about what you know. But if they have discovered over the course of time, and as we all know, relationships take time, uh, they're going to know you care, and they're going to listen to you because you've earned, you've won that right to be heard. Um, you could also, I guess you could say this, that relational ministry could be also called modeling because what are we doing? We're modeling the message. We're modeling the one that we want them to have a relationship with, and that, of course, is Christ himself. And that's why it is so important that we do not, you know, develop a personality rapport with young people. We want to develop a doctrinal rapport with them so that they know exactly where we stand. You know, you want a relationship with me, you got to know that by having a relationship with me, we're going to be talking about the things of God. We're going to be thinking about the things of God. We're going to be, 
you know, this is going to be our language. The language is going to be biblical. Uh, our, the direction that we go in life is going to be the direction that God leads us in. We're going to pray. We're going to have a meaningful relationship based upon an eternal value system. We're not going to just be hanging out. We're not just going to be spending time together. We're not just going to be wasting time. We're going to have genuine, bona fide fellowship. And what young people need today, perhaps now more than ever before, are men and women that will uh, provide positive role models for young people to follow. They, they want to see the message. They, they might not even have a capacity to hear it yet, but they want to see it lived out before them. And then, you know, Jesus, Jesus said this about his own disciples and about you and I. He said people would know his disciples by watching them. John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. He said, if you have love one for another, you're going to be sending a message to the watching world. What's that message? You're my disciples. They're going to know it. They're going to see it. It's going to be clear. It's going to be obvious to them. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, he said, set an example for other believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. He said, uh, you can set an example. Be an example for others. Uh, don't let anybody despise your youth. And by the way, when Paul wrote to Timothy, Timothy was probably in his 40s when Paul said that. So don't get the idea that Timothy was like 19 years old. He was in his 40s, and Paul said, you're a young man. Don't let anybody despise your youth. But you can be an example. You can model the message, again, in your life, love, speech, faith, purity. And in the end, you know, the bottom line is, in the end, um, effective relationships are what are going to make the difference in your youth ministry. That's what it's going to come down to. It won't be necessarily that they will, you know, remember your message. Uh, and you might have some good ones. And I think that that's great if that should happen, when that happens. That, that is amazing. Thank God for that. But it might not be that they will, you know, years down the road, a decade later, even more than that later, when you run into them, they're going to say, oh, my God, hey, you know, uh, I, I, I'll never forget August 12th, 1987, that message you preached. That was awesome. Because you probably don't remember it let alone them. Nobody, they're not going to say, you know what they're going to say? They're going to say, you really cared about me. I came to that Bible study. I came to that church. I was a part of your youth ministry. I went to your camp. This is why our selection of camp counselors is so crucial because we want to find people that really care about these young people, these campers that are going to come. And for one week, they're going to pour the life of Christ into them and hopefully model a message that is undeniable, that is irrefutable, that these young people can look at, watch, listen, learn from, and be discipled just by watching them for one week. And then they'll never forget that as long as they live. I mean, we've heard testimonies like that. We've gotten uh, testimonies sent to us in the mail and via email already since camp ended last month. The young people saying it was so amazing. I've never been so loved. It was the best week of my life. And that's incredible because I guarantee it was because they were surrounded by people that loved them and they developed new relationships within the context of the body of Christ. And there's nothing quite like that. Amen? So relational ministry. Any questions before we move on? Relational youth ministry. Let's kind of review it very quickly. Um, why a relational ministry? Because relationships change people's lives. Every one of us have been changed personally because of somebody, right? Person that led you to Christ, person that discipled you, person that taught you, person that pastored you, uh, a mentor, Christian mentor, whatever. Um, we need relationships and they are very, very important. And then of course, a relational ministry, youth ministry is biblical. Secondly, a relational ministry is responsible. Uh, you're going to have to put in the time. You're going to have to make the commitment. And a relational ministry is effective. Yes. Let's, let's uh, have you use this microphone so that the folks listening on tape can hear your question as well. What do you do when what you teach or what you speak about or the way you live is contradict, contradicts the way their parents living or 
the things that their parents are teaching. Repeat that question. Like, what do you do if the, the things that you are teaching them are going against what their parents, is, parents okay. are teaching them? Sure. Okay, that, and there's, there, that's when you have a real, you have a conflict, okay? Let's say you have a young man, a young woman in your youth ministry. You, uh, they come, they enjoy it, they're being ministered to. Maybe they come to Christ, they're born again. Um, but this is not very popular when they go home and they let their parents know that they've become a born-again Christian and the parents don't like it, the parents don't understand it, um, and they don't want their young person to be a part of it. Well, I would say that the first step in a relationship like that is if it's possible for you to try to meet with the parents, to, for you to ask to have an audience with them where you can sit down and so that they can at least be comforted by the fact that their child is not involved in some kind of cult-like activities or, or some strange phenomenon or group that, uh, you know, uh, that the, the, uh, the children don't even want their parents to know about. You need to go to them and you say, this is who we are. You could bring some information about the ministry, uh, maybe some, uh, a pamphlet or a package, a, a statement of faith that tells them just exactly what you believe, what we believe is a ministry. You can invite the parents to come. Now, much to the demise and the dismay of young people, uh, the thought of their parents being there is not a good one. But some young people welcome it. And, of course, some parents would welcome it as well. Give them a chance to see that what you're doing is you're not necessarily indoctrinating these children or, you know, brainwashing these children. But this is a, an environment uh, of faith, an environment of love, an environment of, an ex of acceptance. There's also other activities that they're involved with, that they're participating in, that are very healthy, wholesome. You're developing uh, an environment, um, really a, a sociological environment that's very healthy that will help them to establish relationships with other people and their peers. And I think that if, if the parents are willing to at least come and see and to check it out, your chances of them allowing their children to continue to participate may be good. Now, if you simply meet with them and they are defiant and they want nothing to do with you, maybe they've heard something about your church and it's negative or derogatory, um, you know, that's when you can just say to the young person, look, we're just gonna, you're going to have to honor your parents. I'm assuming, of course, that this is a young person that is under the age of 18 and they are still under the authority of their home and parents. And then they, I, I would recommend that they submit what it is that their parents request, but encourage them to continue to pursue and to seek after God and to continue to read their Bible and to continue to pray and to, and, and to at least seek out believers whenever they have the opportunity. If not in the setting of your youth ministry, perhaps at school where they can seek out other believers, perhaps seek out other believers in a church that their parents find acceptable. In other words, it's not the end of the world. And very rarely have I witnessed that a young person just is you know, thrown back into the world and forever lost because they could not participate in our youth ministry. God is faithful. We know that. And sometimes he has to be trusted, and we can communicate that with a young person in these you know, extraordinary circumstances. And as they believe God and trust God, and you can help them through that process as much as it's possible, um, they'll be able to get through it. And then sometimes they reach that age uh, where they are no longer uh, under the authority of their parents. I mean, sometimes they're 18 years old and they just say, look, mom and dad, now it's my choice, it's my decision. Um, appreciate very much the way you raised me, the way you brought me up, and, but I'm making my own decision now and this is what my decision is. And then it falls into the category of, you know, just outright, Maybe, and maybe it's persecution. It's just as Jesus said. Jesus said, don't think that I've come to bring peace to a home. I've come to bring a sword. And a mother is divided against her daughter, and a father against her son, and a mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law. Jesus said that. And that can happen. And sometimes we look at that and we say, oh, no, Lord, you have not united this house. You have divided this house. And Jesus would say, that's right. And in order for that house to be united, it must first be divided. That's not unlike God to operate that way. I mean, I, I know that, you know, my parents were very, very suspect when I came into the ministry at first. It was not a traditional church. It was not a mainline denomination. 
They were very leery of it. They were very concerned. They threatened me initially that I was not going to be able to live under their roof if I continued to do this. But I prayed and I just sought God and I just said, listen, the first time in my life, God, I have peace. Now my parents are threatening to throw me out of my home. Um, I mean, I was only 17 years old, so I didn't know what to do, but I prayed. I committed it to God. And, you know, it kind of blew over and they began to see, they began to see a process take place of change, of transformation. They really did thought. They thought at first it was just a phase that I was going through. And they thought, well, just let him get it out of his system. And then he'll, you know, he'll be back to normal. But I never came back to normal. You know, and to this. But now, they, now what, what do they do? They just say, this is what you were supposed to do. This is what, you know, this is your calling. Can't imagine you doing anything else. It's almost like this was made for you. It fits you like a glove. And now they see it. Now they accept it. But they did not at first. They did not at first. They thought, they did. Years later, they said to me, they confided in me. They said, we thought you were in a cult. We thought you were being brainwashed. And um, uh, we thought that we might have to have you deprogrammed. And I said, well, to your credit, I said, you got to give yourself some credit. I said, you raised me in such a way that you allowed me to make my own decisions and to live with those decisions and to live with the consequences of those decisions. And I am grateful that you did that. So really, it reflects back upon you. You, 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 know, you put the right things in, and the right things came out. You did a good job. You did at least a half-decent job. I mean, I wouldn't say, you know, I want to say good. I don't want to pat myself on the back. But, I mean, you know, I think you did a good job parenting. That's what I told them. And they were kind of happy about that. <laughs> like, I guess we did. And, you know, because I'll tell you what. Had they had me deprogrammed, um, we could have severed our relationship for a long, long time. If not, in some cases, forever. I've seen that happen. I've seen concerned parents see their young people get involved in a good, healthy, bona fide, biblical Christian ministry, and because they don't understand it and they are afraid of it, they have, you know, they hired a deprogrammer, and then they, they, they created walls, they built walls that even to this day still last and, and have divided homes and families because they just did not trust that, that young person to make their own decisions. And I'm not talking about, you know, when they were like 10 or 12 years old. I'm talking about... 18, 19, 20-year-olds. It's frightening that that happens, but it does. Did you have another? Yeah. Get that microphone back out. Just be a little bit more specific on this. Um, we have a few kids in the Sunday school, middle school program mm -hmm. where they are like nonstop playing video games and watching horrors and thriller movies and you know th their brains are fried by Sunday morning they mm -hmm. are sleeping and yep. they admit it because of video games and they admit it because of parents letting them playing video games shooting and bloody and killing and mm -hmm. the same thing on, on the TV yeah so what do you do with that one um, I think the best way to do it is to creatively teach about it to talk about it to um, to talk about the reality uh, of the capacity that they're creating within their souls for that kind of material. I mean, something as simple as as you know what we call GIGO, garbage in, garbage out. If you take in all of that garbage, then all of that garbage is going to come out. You know, you're putting that in your soul. You're putting those images in your mind. Um, I mean, we, we went up to camp and and. People that I know very close to me, they uh, were going to come up and stay for a couple of nights, so we had to take them off the campsite and put them in a little hotel up in the Pocono Mountains. When they get up there, uh, they were like maybe the only people that were in this little row of motel rooms. And, um, and they began to say, you know, we can't stay here. And I was like, why? Because, you know, the, the, the slasher, the murderer, the guy with the knife is going to come out of the woods and he's going to kill us all. And I said, well, why would you think that? Because it's in the movie. We saw the movie. And it was like, but this isn't a movie. This is a cabin in the Pocono Mountains. And the camp's right down the street. Yeah, but we've seen, and, and all of it. In other words, what they, what, they, what they sensed that night was that almost every horrible horror film that they had ever saw, every minute of it came back the moment that they were going into that little hotel room. It was almost like the devil says, look, put it in now. 
and I'll just leave it there, and it'll be lodged within your soul. It'll be deposited in there, and I'll bring it back at the right time. When I need to torment you, when I need to fill your heart with fear, when I need to fill your mind with horror or torment so that you're paralyzed and you can't think with God and you can't even find a thought from God, it'll be there. So we have to instruct them, say, listen, this is what you're filling your soul with. You know, there's certain gates to the soul. It's the ear gate. It's the eye gate. And whatever you take in through those gates, it enters into your soul. And you don't want to deposit just anything in that soul, right? I mean, it's kind of like, you know, if you were going to plant a garden, uh, what would you do? Uh, may, would you go out? Would you just kind of grab some, you know, weeds and stuff and the seeds and, and they find on the, on the sides of the road and throw it in there? Or would you say, I'm going to go out and I'm going to purchase some quality seeds, because what I want to come up from the ground is something that is fruitful and healthy and that's going to be a blessing. You'd pay the price to put the right seed in the ground to bring forth the proper harvest. We would say to them, you've got to pay the price to put the right kinds of seeds in the fertile ground of your soul and your mind because you want to bring forth a harvest of truth, of life, of faith, of rest, of peace, and all of the things that God promises us. So it's, it's got to be taught very carefully. I mean, you've got to take the time. Now, maybe their capacities are only 10 minutes, a 10-minute soul capacity. Fine. Teach about it for 10 minutes. And then lay down your boundaries. Put the boundaries out there. Okay, when we meet, we do not have, you know, uh, the iPods or the, the, the DVD players or the video players or we're not playing video games. We're not going to do it. Because I'll tell you, they, they gravitate. It's incredible. It's just incredible. When we go up to New York City, we take a, a trip up there every Christmas with the young people. And we have, the, we have such an amazing time. We go to Rockefeller Center and we sing Christmas carols. And then we preach the gospel and we give out gospel tracts. And people's lives are really, really touched. It's amazing. This year, we'll go down to Ground Zero. The new memorial will be open. We'll minister there. We'll minister in Times Square, Penn Station. Staten Island Ferry, that's a great place where we go. We get a permit, and all those people that come in, hundreds of people to take the ferry from Manhattan to Staten Island, they're not going anywhere. They've got to hear what I have to say. It's amazing. But they all listen. And then we give a gospel invitation, and they raise their hands and receive Christ. It's incredible. But you know what? That bus, you can have 55 seats in that bus. It can be loud. It can be crazy. It can, it, it's just absolute chaos. And I, you know, I know how to, you know how I get that. You know how I get that quiet in just a second. I just say, put a video in. I put a video in, and these kids that are all animated and alive, they say, it's just like, Bleh. <laughs> <laughs> and then we, you know, we shut it off for a minute. Can I have your attention? Ah. I mean, it's it's unbelievable. And, and we somehow, creatively, we've got to say, this is what happens to your soul when you take in all of that garbage. You can't let that happen. Your soul was not created by God for that stuff. And then you say, you know, your soul was created by God for this. And then, you know, creatively, patiently, compassionately, lovingly, carefully, it's on us to find a way to impart it to their souls. Because there's no, there's, no, there's no book that you're going to be able to you know, buy, the how-to of youth ministry, and say, just do this. It's going to take love, investment, consistency, faithfulness, time, a laid-down life, and model the message. And it's going to work. It's going to work. I'm not going to say it's going to work right across the board because you're going to have some people that just take that in so consistently uh, that their souls may never recover from that, honestly. But if there's any chance, if there's any hope of reaching them, that's the way you're going to do it. And then you're going to develop this capacity. When you speak, they're going to listen. It might start out by listening for five minutes. Uh, six months later, they got a 10-minute capacity. A year or two later, they can listen to you for 20 minutes. After that, you can preach a full, you know, you can go half an hour, preach the, the word of God. You got him. You got him. And I mean, because I value the preaching and the communication of the word of God, I'm not going to tolerate anything. 
This is just me personally. If I see a young person and they're going to text message while I'm preaching, no, they're not. Not because of me, not because of me, not because, hey, don't you know who I am and what I've done for the church? It's not my attitude. My attitude is this is the word of God. You will not dishonor the word of God by text messaging or by communicating or talking or being distracted or, you know, writing some pictures on your paper. No. You want to do that, you don't have to be here. I'm not going to tolerate it. Some people say, oh, that's too high. No, it isn't. It's not too high. We love them. But you know you're here. And if you can't give me 20 or 30 minutes of your attention, then your soul has got to be rewired. It's got to be reoriented. It's got to be changed. You really need to be transformed. And so, you know, they just, you, just, you just don't tolerate it. And I'll tell you what, over the, over the years, you know what happens is that you try to keep these standards, and it is. It's tough. It's not easy. We used to have a standard in the youth ministry where it was, well, we had a policy. No headphones, no earbuds, no iPod. We, but you know what? I'll be honest with you. We don't have it anymore. Because they, I'll be honest with you. They just wore us out. Because they were sneaking it, and they were hiding it. And, 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 then, and then you look around and you say, listen, kids, no headphones. And then they'd point at the youth leaders and go, they got it. And poor Matt Vieta was over there listening to Pastor Stephen's message and going, it's pastor. And they're like, yeah, mine, I got pastor too. <laughs> and it's like you listen to it and go, that's not pastor. But I, I, I'm just going to be honest with you. They, they, they just, and then you don't, if you don't get every, if everybody's not on the same page in the youth ministry, or if everybody's not on the same page in the administration, if somebody in a position of authority says, oh, that's no big deal, let them do it, and you can't win. You've got to have this united front, that's, and everybody's on the same page. I mean, when it comes to, like, camp, for instance, we say, no, we have a no-toleration policy. No phones, no iPod. We say, camp starting, if you brought one with you, because we say clearly on our, on our information that's given out before you come to camp, you can't have these things. We put a box up on the stage at our orientation meeting. We say, put it in the box, put your name on it, we'll give it back to you at the end of camp. Now, most of them don't do that. They say, I, no, I don't have one. They got it. They hide it. They sneak it. If we find it, we take it. We confiscate it. Or it gets stolen. And when it does, I go, ha, ha. <laughs> Told you. It's kind of like we, when you get to camp, we don't, have, we don't operate with money. We say you were on a... You know, you give your money to the camp bank, and then at the end of camp, whatever you don't spend, you get back. They're like, I'm not trusting you with my money. And we say, well, if you don't, you, you'll get it stolen. Oh, no, you don't know the hiding places I have. <laughs> and then they all come to you one by one. Somebody stole my money. I said, well, did you put it in the camp bank? No. Because I didn't think you guys would be able to take care of it. Oh, but you thought you'd do a better job. Yeah, but it's gone. <laughs> Can you give me my money back? No, we can't give you your money back. And you know that phone that's in your pocket? You're going to lose that next. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's just the point is that you've you got to have these. I mean, for camp, it works for the most part. I know that there may be isolated moments and breakdowns, but I mean, you can't believe what happens at camp. Because some of these kids, it's like withdrawals. It's like withdrawals. Like if they ever walked by a cabin and, and, it, and there was a television in it, it would be like they walk by, oh, is that a TV? You think I could just look at it through the window for a couple of minutes? It's like withdrawals. But after a day or two or three, all of a sudden, they, get, they, get, they adjust. It's like, my God, I can live without it. It's like you and I. We, we don't believe that we can live without our cell phones anymore. Have you ever left your cell phone at home? Left the house? I have. And no matter what happens, I have to go back. I have to go. You'd think that I was, somebody was drowning back there, and I've got to go save them. It's a phone. We, we really believe that we can't live without that phone now. Some of you are looking at the phone right now. <laughs> Did I just get a message while he was saying that? Come on. It's true. But it's because of the way we've oriented our souls. And young people are the same way. And I'm telling you, we just, we got to break. It's like a habit. But remember this about habits. Bad habits are not broken. They are replaced. Bad habits are the direct result of bad thought patterns. And you can't break thought patterns, but you can replace them with new 
thought patterns. And that's God's plan. That's God's process. That's the way God works. The, pr the principle of replacement. No, we're not going to be able to break every bad habit they have. But what can we do? We can introduce a new way of thinking. And as we introduce a new way of thinking, then you're going to see some old ways of thinking replaced. And you're going to see some old habits, maybe even some bad habits, replaced because of a new way of thinking. It's literally the principle of replacement. And in the kingdom of God, it's what, it's what we use. It's how we operate. It's what works. But none of these things happen overnight. In as much as it's taken time for them to develop these habits, it will take time for God to establish new thinking patterns within their soul. But if you're patient, and if you're in it for the long haul, then you're going to see a difference. And you're going to, be, you're going to rejoice at what God can do when you make the commitment on your end and say, hey, I'm, 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 I'm. it's almost like you can say to young people, listen, I, I'm with you. You know, sometimes there's so much turnover in youth ministry. I remember back in the days of Lennox when we lived there in western Massachusetts, the ministry was there years and years ago. Um, they didn't even have a youth pastor. It was just somebody that worked with the young people. It was almost like they were just taking care of them for a little while, and then they were gone. And then somebody else came in, and then somebody else was with them. And then somebody else came in, and then, and then you know, I came, and, and I literally remember a group of young people saying, well, yeah, you're going to probably be here for a little while, and then you're going to leave too. And I, I didn't have any intention of leaving. I said, no, I'm here. I'm going to stay. And they're like, uh-huh, sure, whatever. Everybody says that. In other words, they were like the unwanted children. They were like the children that nobody really wanted. And it was like, no, we're here. We're here. We're, we're, we're going to be with you. We're staying with you. We're not going anywhere. They were like, yeah, right. They were so used to having somebody come, stay with them for a while, and then say, okay, I'm moving on, and then you know, somebody else would come and replace them. But we did. We stayed. And that made a difference. That really made a difference. Because we didn't go anywhere. We just said, we're here. You know, day after day, week after week, month after month, and then it became year after year. And of course, for you and I, youth ministry, we all know that it's transitional. I mean, you don't keep, it's not like they're, they're your church. If you, if you were pastoring a church, you might pastor a church for 30, 40, 50 years. But with teenagers and young people, you might pastor them for three or four years, but then they move on. You don't keep them. But you make such an investment in their lives that you prepare them for the next phase of their Christian walk and experience before God, which will be the local assembly or some form of ministry that God calls them to. And then they can look back with a real great sense of gratitude and say, you know what? We, came, we were in a good uh, minis a youth ministry. We had people that cared about us, that loved us, that invested in us, that showed us what it was to go soul winning, that showed us the importance of studying the Bible. They preached to us. It was really the Bible. It was the Word of God. It was not some little moral sermonette. And, and we, we really we were edified. We were challenged. We were, uh, you know, we were built up. We understood who we were in Christ, and it really made a difference. All right, let's take a break. Another break. Let's uh, meet, we'll reassemble here at 8.15.